Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on Instagram at snoozecast to find behind the scenes content. If you'd like to get an email once a week with upcoming sleep stories and other news, subscribe to this newsletter at snoozecast.com. This episode is brought to you by White Pebbled Cavern Floors. Tonight, we'll read selections from The Bird Watcher in the Shetlands by Edmund Sellis, written in 1905. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to listen to our others from this bird watching series at snoozecast.com slash series. The author started as a conventional naturalist of his time, but Celis developed himself into a pioneer of peaceful bird watching as a method of scientific study. The author was a solitary man and was not well known in ornithological circles. He avoided both the company of ornithologists and reading their observations so as to base his conclusions entirely on his own. He has gifted future generations with his beautiful and intuitive writing on birds. The island of Shetland is the northernmost part of Scotland. It has a complex geology, a rugged coastline, and many low, rolling hills. The islands have produced a variety of prose writers and poets, who have often written in the distinctive Shetland dialect of the Scots language. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. coastline of this Shetland island, where the cliffs, without being very high, are steep and frowning. There are some remarkable caves, which I today visited with a Mr. Hoseason in his boat, he having sailed over from Yell Island. To me, at least, they seemed remarkable principally by reason of the various and vivid colors which the rock perforated by them begins to display as soon as their entrance is passed. This rock, as elsewhere in the Shetlands, is sedimentary, but broken here and there with veins of quartz, often of considerable thickness which seem to have been shot up in a molten state and to have afterwards cooled. Seem, I say, for I have no proper knowledge as to the geological formation. This quartz, which when exposed to the light of day is white or whitish, is here of a deep rust red, and this, distributed in long, zigzag lines or meanderings is sufficiently striking but nothing compared to the much brighter reds the lakes and brilliant greens which the interior of the cavern is as it were painted so that the whole effect lit up by the candles which we used as torches resembled in a surprising and quite unexpected way, those highly colored and very artificial looking representations of natural scenery which one sees on the stage, in pantomimes, more particularly, or on some very florid drop scene. These colors are due to some low form of vegetation which is spread like a wash 
over the face of the stratified rock. But it seems surprising, since one is accustomed to associate color with light, that in the absence of all sun, these plants should not only exist, but the colors be so very brilliant. I have never seen anything like such vivid hues on the surface of rock or cliff exposed to the light of day, nor, indeed, in any landscape, if flowers and the autumn tints of leaves are excluded. Gaudily painted stage scenery, some enchanted or robber's cavern in a pantomime, Alibaba's, for instance, is really the best comparison I can think of nor shall I ever again think these exaggerated. Nature is really harder to outdo, or burlesque, than one may fancy, even on the stage, where the effort is so constantly, and one would swear, successfully made. In shape, these caverns are long and narrow, throatal, one might call them, and the sea, with the many weird and uncouth noises that it makes as it licks, tongue-like, in and out of them, helps to suggest this resemblance, though their height is really but moderate, yet, owing to the narrowness of their walls, they have the appearance of being lofty, especially near the entrance, or where, after descending till it nearly reaches the water, the roof is suddenly carried up again. For the most part, however, the height decreases gradually, with the breath, till at length the cave ends in a low, dark tunnel, which the sea almost fills up, and up which the boat can no longer proceed. Yet far beyond, where all is opaque darkness, one still hears the muffled wash of the waves as they ceaselessly eat and eat into the hidden bowels of the rock. As the whole force and vastness of the ocean lies beyond this little tip of its tongue, to where may not such burrows extend, and might not, by a knowledge of their position and the direction in which they run, some inland towns be supplied with the blessing of sea water. The water in these caverns is delightfully clear, revealing in every detail, through its lucid green, the smooth rolled pebbles and great white rounded boulders which strew or rather make their floor. To look down at them is like looking up into the arched roof of some other cave. One might think it the reflection of the one overhead, till, glancing up, the difference is remarked. Jagged, bright-hued peaks and niches, instead of smooth, even whiteness. This effect, as of a roof beneath one, is due, I think, to the continuation downwards of the sides of the cavern, for this gives the same vaulted appearance, but reversed, that there is overhead, and the mind, as with the image of the retina in the eye, soon sets it the right way up. These caves must have been known from time immemorial to as many as were accustomed to coast round the island, and it is interesting to think of who and what kind of craft may, from age to age, have visited or sheltered in them. Recently, however, they were first explored, if not discovered, by Mr. Hoseason, who has for years rented the island 
and done his best to protect the bird life upon it in the spring of the preceding year. And they were at that time tenanted by numbers both of shags and rock pigeons, who sat incubating their eggs on any suitable ledge or projection of the rock. Of the latter birds, today, there were none, but several of the former, though so late in the season, were sitting on eggs which, to judge by their whiteness, must have been but lately laid, and, no doubt, represented a second brood, whilst others, whose young were still with them on the nest, although full-fledged and almost as big as themselves, plunged, attended by these, into the water. The hollow sounds of splash after splash were echoed and re-echoed from sea to roof, and the air seemed filled with croakings. It was easy to follow these birds as they swam midway between the surface of the water and the white pebbled floor of the cavern, and I was thus able to confirm my previous conviction that the feet alone are used by them in swimming, without any help from the wings, which are kept all the while closed. I have many times observed this before, but never so clearly, or for such a length of time. The young birds, after diving, made for the nearest rock or ledge, Unto which they could scramble, and they were so unwilling again to take the water that some of them showed some signs of fear, which one might naturally suppose them to feel. This is a puzzling thing to understand, at least to me. An aquatic bird that swims and dives all as easily as it breathes, and which has just before plunged into the water from a considerable height, stands now upon a rock but little above its surface, and watches the boat coming nearer and nearer, till at last it stops in front of it. And yet, it doesn't dive into the water. What is the explanation? We may suppose, perhaps, that these young birds have not yet got to look upon the ocean as a place of long abode, that they enter it only with the idea of getting quickly out again, and that the rock is as yet so much more their true home that they cling to it in preference, and may even have a feeling of safety in being there. But if this last were the case, why should they leave it in the first instance? There would be no difficulty in understanding the matter if they refused to take to the sea at all. But having done so once, it seems strange that they should dislike to again. Possibly the having soon to come out, as being impelled to do so, and finding themselves no better off for it, may give a feeling of inevitability to escape sufficient to take away the power of effort. But this I do not believe. Had it always been the parent bird that led the way on the occasion of the first leap from the rock, this reluctance on the part of the young to leave it a second time might be attributed to her absence. But as far as I can remember, there was no fixed rule in this respect. Both old and young birds generally went off with great unwillingness, but at other times this was not nearly so marked. In their swimming so quickly to the shore again, after their first plunge, and refusing thereafter to leave it, these young cormorants brought to my mind those amphibious lizards of the Galapagos Islands which Darwin mentions as never entering the sea to avoid danger, but, 
on the contrary, always swimming to land on the slightest alarm, though it might be there precisely that danger awaited them. This strange anomaly, Darwin explains in the following manner. Perhaps this singular piece of apparent stupidity may be accounted for by the circumstance that this reptile has no enemy whatever on shore, whereas at sea it may fall prey. Hence, probably, urged by a fixed and hereditary instinct that the shore is a place of safety, whatever the emergency may be, it there takes refuge. The shag, as far as I know, has nothing in particular to be concerned of, either by sea or shore. His only enemy is man, who is not confined to either. But in avoiding danger, the instinct of any animal would probably be to leave the place to which it was less accustomed, and run to that which it is familiar, and this we constantly see. Thus a land bird that was beginning to take to the water would leave it for the land, if in alarm, whilst a water bird, under similar circumstances, would make for the water. But all water birds were probably land birds once, so that we might expect sometimes to see in their young that old instinct of taking refuge there, which had become reversed in the parents. When once the parents had plunged, however, they did not, like the young birds, swim at once for the shore again, but made for the open sea, and it must have required a strong contrary instinct on the part of the latter not to follow them. The lizards of the Galapagos Islands have, no doubt, also taken to the sea gradually, so that their habit of swimming to the shore when alarmed may, possibly, be due to a long, enduring, ancestral instinct. We passed, whilst exploring one of these caves, just beneath a ledge of rock, where a shag sat brooding over two tiny little things, but just hatched, perfectly naked, and jet black all over. The hoarse, bellowing cries of the mother bird reverberated through all the place, and helped, with the gloom, the murky light flung by our candles, the bright coloring of the walls, and the deep, gurgling noises of the sea, to make a weird picture, difficult to excel. But it was not in sound alone that she vented her displeasure at seeing us there. As the boat passed, she rose on the nest and, in a frenzy, snapped her bill and alternately advanced and retreated her long, darkly iridescent green neck. Though my head was but a foot or two away from her at one point, she kept her place on the nest. Right at that moment, however, she flung herself into the water. What a strange sight this was. What a gargoyle of a creature. Alive in these gloomy shades. It seems not a bird, but something in the fairy queen. Did the fairies exist, they would be classified, and with Latin names and description of their habits, would be no more really the fairies than our birds or beasts. Let one but know nothing, and these caverns are enchanted. It is not often that one has so close a view of a shag as this. My head was but a foot or so off, and on a level with her own, my eyes looked into her glass-green ones. One thing about her struck me with wonder, and that was the intense brilliancy of the whole inside of her mouth, which, in a blaze of color, seemed to imitate in miniature the cavern in which she sat. 
I did notice, however, that the naked skin about the beak of one of her baby birds is thus vividly colored as well, and very much lighter, so it was consequently not nearly so handsome in the larger fledged young ones, that here the intensity of the hue was gained gradually, I can have no doubt, and the lesser degree of it in the young bird would be due to a well-known principle of inheritance, which has been pointed out, or, rather, discovered by Darwin. I must now watch for these young cormorants to open their bills, for it is a habit which they share, more or less, with their parents, and out of it, as I believe, the adornment has grown. This is, in fact, the case. I have no doubt that numbers of shags roost in these caverns during the night, for when I was lost on an isle of sky, I came to a huge vaulted chamber in the cliffs, into which scores, perhaps hundreds, both of these birds and the common cormorant flew after the sun had set. When they were all settled, every ledge, crevice, and pinnacle seemed tenanted by them, and never shall I forget the gloom, the grandeur, and the loneliness of this scene. I admired it, though naked, except for a torn pair of trousers, which were half wet through. I should like to see them come flying into their caves here also, where I am not so forlorn, but the distance of my hut from this part of the shore, the lateness of the hour up to which the light lasts, and my having to cook my supper, makes this difficult, or, at least, inconvenient. But if I cannot see them fly in the evening, I may see them fly out in the morning. Whilst rowing to these caves, we had seen one black guillemot, or tysty, flying over the sea with a fish in its bill, and another swimming with a young one by its side. The latter was of a grayish color, and about a third smaller than the parent bird, which in shape and movements it closely resembled. These birds, therefore, breed in the Shetlands, a fact well known before, I believe, but I like to rediscover things. Another and more interesting thing that we saw was a seal swimming very fast and leaping at intervals out of the water. I think I may use this expression, for if he did not leap quite free of it, he very nearly did, so as to show his whole body. He rose in a very bluff, bold way, with great impetus, as it seemed, and went straight, or nearly straight up for a little, before falling forward again. Each time one seemed to hear the splash and the blow, but this was only in imagination, the distance being too great. When I say that this seal was swimming very fast, I am giving my impression merely. All I saw was the leaps, which were quickly repeated, yet with a good space between each, and all in one direction. Between them, therefore, he must have been speeding along at a great pace, so that, each time he plunged up, it was as from a springboard of impetus and energy. I do not remember reading of seals leaping thus out of the water, but Mr. Hoseason had seen them do so before, though not often. There was a fine, joyous spirit in the thing. There is joy as well as sorrow on the sea. 
It is good to see an animal like this in the United Kingdom, or at least in its seas, for, for a moment, it makes one think one is out of it, and in some wilder, more life-teeming part of the world. It is hard to have to live in a country glorified as being a network of railways, and to have no taste for railways. O oh, wretched modern world of noise and improvement, what a vile place art thou becoming for one who loves nature and only cares for man in books, the best books, of course. I have been watching the black guillemots, like the common ones, they often carry a fish they have caught for a very long time in the bill before swallowing it or even before giving it to their young. They will swim with it for half an hour or so, constantly dipping it beneath the water and apparently nibbling on it with the bill whilst they hold it thus submerged. Then, finding themselves near a rock which is ascendable, they ascend it, and lie couched there for a while, resting, always with the fish in their bill. Anon, with refreshed energies, they re-enter the sea with it, and, if very patient and prepared to watch them indefinitely, one may at last see this fish swallowed. But I hardly think I should be exaggerating were I to say that hours may pass in this way. They usually hold the fish by the middle, or just below the head, and if they want to shift their hold from one place to the other, they sink down their bills into the water, as though better able to do so through its medium. To mandibulate a fish in the air quite freely, as does the cormorant, is perhaps beyond their power. Any moment, however, may show me that it is not. So, too, when I have seen them swallow the fish, they have done so in the same way. Instead of raising the head and gulping it down, they gulped it up with the water to help them though I can hardly think that they are compelled to act in this way. These little birds, old ocean's pets, his darlings, seem to me to play at fighting, while swimming together in little changing troops, for the numbers are always increasing or diminishing. They constantly approach one another in a threatening manner, the body raised in the water, the head held straight up, and the mandibles opening and shutting like a slender pair of scissors. Yet it hardly ever ends in anything, nor does the threatened bird seem really alarmed. Generally, the threatener, as he comes alongside, subsides into quiet humdrum, or two birds, after circling round one another in this way, each almost on its own pivot, like a pair of whirligig corks, both quiet down. Each, whilst thus acting, will, at intervals, drop the head and sink the beak a little in the water one of their most usual actions. Sometimes, indeed, there will be a little bit of a scuffle. But if there be fighting, still more is there the play or pretense of fighting, which is tending to pass into a social sport or dance. The antics of birds are often so very curious and the whole subject of their origin and meaning is so full of interest. 
that nothing which might, by any possibility, throw light upon this ought to be neglected, or can be too closely observed. I believe that the feelings of animals pass easily from one channel into another, and that, therefore, nervous excitement brought forth by one kind of emotion is, in its turn, producing of another kind, so that any special transition of this sort were at all frequent, it might, through memory and association of ideas, become habitual.